Swayam Prabha Digital India Educated India Welcome back to the NPTEL lecture series on bioelectricity. So, in the previous uh, class, while talking about the photosynthesis, we distinguished between the light reaction and the dark reaction. And uh, I mentioned that I will be only talking about the light reaction and the electron transport phenomena, which essentially is an inspiration to develop next generation of solar cells, where uh, we will be able to replace silicon based uh, panels with some kind of molecules which are much more cheaper, much more easy and much more sustainable. Okay. So, in the light reaction section, we I enumerated that there will be 6 point initially I will be taking care. First one will be the structure of the chloroplast which we have discussed in our previous class. Then the basic reaction of water plus carbon dioxide making carbohydrates plus oxygen. And in this class, we will be discussing two topics. One is all those historical landmarks where this simple, simple reaction of carbon dioxide and water forming carbohydrate and oxygen. Who are the people who set the ball rolling for us? wherever we are today, it is because of those seminal contribution made by these individuals who ensure that you know we follow the track right. Okay. And after that we will be talking about the structure of the chlorophyll and the different types of chlorophyll and uh, their absorption spectrum and uh, how the slight structural differences change their spectral properties. Okay. So, let us start with it where so our first slide will be the one which uh, we enumerated in the last class that is we will be talking about the structure of the chlorophyll which is done. We are done with the we are done with the basic reaction and let us now move on to the discovery of the basic reaction CO 2 plus H 2 O forming C H 2 O N plus oxygen. As back as 1700, plant releases oxygen discovered by Joseph Priestley. Okay. The experiment which, we, which was done by Priestley was fairly simple. What he did is something like okay let me show you so for example you have a, you have a plant out here okay some kind of you know indoor plant this and uh, so you grow this plant inside a uh, chamber like this. So, where light is falling and it is connected with whatsoever gas is being released, it is sealed. Okay. Inside you is another chamber where you have an animal. Okay. So, we know that if one individual is confined inside a room without supplying oxygen, this individual will eventually die, because we need continuous supply of oxygen. And that holds true for uh, any animal which survives on earth, it depends on oxygen. So, this was the experimental setup, where it was proved by Joseph Priestley that essentially during the process, plant are releasing something called oxygen. And that was the beginning of the journey 
of understanding what we understand today as the modern photosynthesis. Okay. So, let us highlight this. Okay. So, this was basically coming back. So, this was this component that it is evolving oxygen was by Joseph Trisley and this was back in 1780, okay, almost three centuries back. Next one to follow was the discovery that this process requires light was by a gentleman called Jan Eigenhaus. He discovered that this process can only happen in the presence of light. So, essentially in the last class while I was telling you people that photosynthesis could be divided into light reaction and dark reaction. Okay. So, this light reaction is dependent on light was also discovered. So, let us at this point. So, here is the light which is now adding the new component H nu or light and this discovery was made by Jan Huygenhaus. That light is involved in it. Okay. Followed by this the next discovery of carbon dioxide, this process is being regulated by carbon dioxide. Without carbon dioxide, sun regulated this, the essential component of this or the reactant of this whole machinery is carbon dioxide. This was done by another scientist called Joe Senebier. Okay. Uh, carbon dioxide, and this credit goes to Okay. So, now we are left with who discovered water and water is involved in it. So, there was another gentleman called Theodore Saucer. Theodore Saucer is credited with the discovery that, uh, that water is involved in this process was Theodore Theodore de and this whole reaction that carbon dioxide plus water in the presence of light forming carbohydrate plus evolving oxygen was completely put in place by Meyer. Okay. So, just uh, this whole thing. So, there is a transformation of light energy into chemical energy. As by Julius Robert Meyer. Essentially, solar energy to chemical energy. So, overall if you look at it, this is pretty much is the scheme of photosynthesis, where there is the carbon dioxide sequestration taking place. And uh, if you currently see, this is one of the challenging problem in nature, how we could reduce the pollution by you know sequestering carbon dioxide. So, the complete vegetative cover of the on the floor of earth essentially. So, let, let me put the so carbon dioxide sequestration. So, during this whole process of photosynthesis almost 10 to the power 10 tons of carbon 
is forming plus organic matter. In other words, 10 to the power 17 kilocalorie of free energy is uh, made by plants globally. So, globally the plants are producing that much energy by ensuring the carbon dioxide available along with water in the presence of light transform it into biomass. And uh, even if we could you know mimic part of it, this will be a big benefit to mankind and there is enormous effort in several countries across the world on carbon dioxide sequestration going on. Somewhere or other we have to reduce the pollution, how we can reduce the pollution, we could sequester carbon dioxide. Okay. People are using different kind of algae, different kind of uh, other mechanism to sequester it. Okay. So, now coming back to this. So, with this brief historical perspective about how this simple reaction has evolved since 1700, which is almost now 18, almost 400 years, uh, nearing 400 years. So, now what we will do, we will talk about the fundamental molecules. So, if you go back here, let me go back to the structure where we were kind of, yeah. So, this is where the light is falling. You see this black. And the first molecule which gets activated by it is chlorophyll. So, now what we will do is we will talk about the structure of chlorophyll. So, before I get into the structure of chlorophyll, just for a, a revision sake, I will just go through the electromagnetic radiation, who stands where, where the IR is standing and all those things. Okay, I will do that first, but even before that, let us give you an overall outline, what exactly is happening in photosynthesis. So, essentially what happens is, when the light falls on the plants and it hits upon the chlorophyll molecule. Chlorophyll molecule ejects an electron, fair enough. As soon as a molecular species ejects an electron, it gets oxidized. Now, this electron which is getting ejected travels through a cascade of molecules. So, what it does this electron goes and attack another molecule. So, as soon as that molecule accept the electron, it gets reduced, but then it comes back to its ground state by donating that electron to the next molecule and from there it donates to the next molecule. So, likewise this electron travels or hop through a series of such molecules and then eventually in that process it creates a proton gradient across the thylakoid membrane and this proton gradient essentially leads to the synthesis of an energy rich molecule called adenosine triphosphate and uh, NADP, which further acts in generating glucose molecules, which is part of the dark reaction. But you remember when I started I told you, when the light falls on the chlorophyll, it ejects an electron. So, that chlorophyll molecule becomes oxidized. So, but if that is the case in no time all the chlorophyll molecules will become oxidized, eventually the plant will die because the machinery cannot function further, but that does not happen. This molecule which gets oxidized is put back into its ground state, how it is being done. So, what happens this is supplied with another electron, this electron comes from another part of the photosystem, 
which is called photo system 2. So, the part what I just now described it for system 1, I will be coming into the real molecular details. So, do not worry about it, I am just telling the global scheme of things. Okay. Now, from photo system 2, exactly the same event happens light falls, electron gets ejected, that electron through a cascade goes and brings back the oxidized electron into its reduced state or its, into its ground state. But in that process, there is another, photos, another chlorophyll molecule which is getting oxidized because it has donated the electron. So, now that second molecule of chlorophyll, so say for example, let me just draw it for your understanding sake. Uh, say for example, this is one chlorophyll molecule okay, CHL, now the light falls on it. Okay. As soon as the light falls, it ejects an electron. Once it rejects an electron, so this is then oxidation reaction O. Okay. So, then of course, I told you the electron travels through a cascade and does its job. No, not worry about it, but how to bring back this chlorophyll back to its ground state. So, this is supplied with another electron out here from another chlorophyll molecule. If I call this as chlorophyll 1, then this is chlorophyll 2. Okay. Now, as soon as this chlorophyll 2 donates this electron, this chlorophyll 2 also gets oxidized. So, it has to be brought back to its ground state. Now, how, how it is being brought back to its ground state? What nature has designed is something a uh, most uh, abundant electron donor and the most abundant molecule on earth is water. So, it is there the water molecule gets a split up. So, what essentially happens is something like this, you have the water molecule plus 4 electron 4 H plus. Okay. So, this is pretty much what is happening and these electrons what you are seeing are the ones which eventually brings that chlorophyll back to its ground state. So, essentially a photosynthesis what we will be talking about, we will be talking about three things. We will be talking about this chlorophyll which forming photosystem 1, this chlorophyll which form and this chlorophyll molecule is coupled with this wonderful water splitting machinery. water splitting machinery which is essentially a manganese cluster. This is the sum total of this thing and very interestingly this manganese cluster which is splitting the water is fairly conserved all over the photosynthetic species which are which has evolved on the floor of earth. It is fairly very well conserved and uh, one by one we will take up all these things, but in order to understand this whole process, we have to first of all understand the structure of the chlorophyll. So, this is the whole thing and you might wonder that why there are what are the catches of this game. So, just to again to give you a global perspective on this thing. If we could essentially split water the way a plant does, which is probably the most efficient means by which a plant does it, then we can produce a lot of hydrogen out here. And we could use this hydrogen because this is one of the challenging problems. This, this hydrogen could be used for let us enumerate where all we get could be used for fuel cell. This is what we are going to study once we will finish the manganese cluster fuel cell. Now, if we understand these, if we could really mimic these kind of a structure, we can make a efficient, cheap solar panels and coupling this 
with these kind of machineries, we can really have a sustainable energy sources. So this is overall the scheme of things. What we are trying to understand, that is the sole reason why we are trying to understand each one of these electron transfer which are happening in biological machines, which if we could emulate even one or two percent of it, of course maintaining the efficiency, we can really solve some of the major energy related issues across the world. Okay? So now coming back where I took the detour to try to you know give you a global perspective of this whole subject why we are kind of you know intensely across the world people are trying to understand this some of these bioelectrical phenomena and the chemicals involved in it. So next what we will do I will just give you an overall outline of the spectrum just draw it for recap and then we will move on to the structure of the chlorophyll molecules. Okay? Now coming back to the spectrum structure of the spectrum where what lies where. Okay. So Put it like this, visible. Okay. Okay. Here are the visible, then you have the IR, then you have the microwave, then you have the radio wave. On the other side, you have UV. X-rays <coughs> and gamma rays. So, if you look at the zone we are talking about, the visible spectrum is around 380 nanometer to. This is all in nanometer. Okay, 380 nanometer to 750 nanometer. Okay, you have your uh, UVs around 280 nanometer. X-rays 100, and these are less than one nanometer. Okay, this is all in nanometer. Whereas, uh, sorry, you cannot see the values. Let me uh, draw the values again. So, visible spectrum, we are talking about uh, okay. So, visible spectrum into 380 nanometer to 750 nanometer. In the IR spectrum, you have more than <coughs> one millimeter. Then in the radio, you have, oh sorry, in the microwave, you have more than a meter, and in the radio waves, which are around 1000 meters. And the UV, we are talking about 280 nanometer, the range of 280 nanometers, and then you have the X rays, which are around 100 nanometer, and the gamma rays, which are less than 1 nanometer. So, this is the kind of a spectrum, and whatsoever we will be talking about, we will be talking about the visible spectrum. So, within the visible spectrum starts with 380. So, you have violet, indigo, blue, green, yellow, orange. Okay. And in the green you are around 560 and yellow around 600, orange and of course, red okay. and red around 750. So, this is pretty much is the spectrum where we will be talking about the absorption of the chlorophyll molecules. So, now coming back to the structure of the chlorophyll molecule. So, if you remember in the structure of the hemoglobin molecule, which is involved in carrying blood all over your uh, carrying oxygen in the blood all over your body. So, it has a polypyrrole ring and in the center you have a iron. In the case of chlorophyll, the molecular architecture is fairly the same, almost the same if not exactly, but uh, only difference is that in the center, there is a magnesium. Okay? Instead of iron, there is a magnesium. So, when we draw the structure we'll, and the chlorophyll are of two types, type A and type B. And type A and type B has some small molecular differences. I will highlight that and that molecular differences leads to the difference in their spectral properties. Okay. Let us draw the structure of the chlorophyll now. Okay. So, I told you, so there is a manganese magnesium cluster out here, 
it. So, you have the manganese in the center, which is all fine, and the nitrogen, 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 and nitrogen. Okay. And then Okay, up to this it was all right, and the mistake what I did was out here. So, basically, there is another bonding which is taking place out here, which okay. So, here you have oxygen out here, you have a hydrogen here. You have CH two, CH three, and then out here you have slightly more modified. There's hydrogen here. There's a CH two. There's a CH two, and you have this R. This R is important because this is the R where the difference are starting. Okay, we'll come back to this. Wait, this is CH three. This is H. And here you have CH three. You have you have CH CH two, and then you have a R group out here. The two R groups. So. I will tell you which one is actually the causes the second you have to redo this again. Okay. You have a R group out here, you have C H two, C H three, and you have another C H 3 molecule out here, and it is almost like this. And uh, then the double bond here, double bond here. Okay. So this R group, okay. Let me just highlight this. This R group, what do you see? This R group is actually, I have to go to the next page. Okay. So, this R group is equal to CH2, CH3, CH3. It's a long side chain out there. CH2, CH, and CH3, CH3. It is this R group which is attached there. Okay, but I showed you another R group which is out here, which is in green. This R group is very important. Okay, now coming back to the. So, if you have seen this structure, this is a very, very, very symmetrical structure. It's, it's really. I myself cannot remember this structure all the time. I kind of have to refer to this structure. Okay, but it's it's really easy to draw this structure as long as you do not have to write those huge side chains which are there. But with this basic structure, there are there are two forms of chlorophyll which are formed, and that change in that form comes in that other R group. You go back to the structure now. If you look at this out here. This one and now circling this R group. This R group varies. What happens is this that R group, what is there, could be two types either that R group could be a CH3 group, a methyl group, or a CHO group. And if it is a CHO group, then this is called 
chlorophyll B and if it is a methyl group this is called chlorophyll A. This is the basic difference between chlorophyll A and chlorophyll B and because as I was telling you because of that one simple change at one of the R groups it is the spectral property slightly varies and that is really helpful because that way there is no rigid single spectrum there are staggered spectrum which happens because of this in terms of the absorption. Now, let us look at the absorption spectrum of chlorophyll A and chlorophyll B ok coming back to the spectrum part ok now let us get the axis right ok ok fine absorption coefficient absorption coefficient which is so as a matter of fact the absorption coefficient of chlorophyll molecule is among the highest found in nature and that is why nature has probably selected chlorophyll as the molecule of choice for its functions ok. Now, chlorophyll B chlorophyll B with chlorophyll A with red. So, chlorophyll A is something like this or let us draw it like this. So, chlorophyll A is a spectrum which starts to taper down like this and then again it starts to pick up and it has another peak out here and then it tapers down. So, this is chlorophyll A which is in red. Now, chlorophyll B I will be drawing it in blue chlorophyll A is slightly staggered and picks up have has its peak out here and then again it also tapers down like this and then starts to take up somewhere out here and one second just one second let me let me draw this spectrum again so chlorophyll b starting like this out here and it comes back and somewhere out here so if you look at both the spectrum very carefully you will observe something as if chlorophyll b is in between the two extremes of chlorophyll a so that way what is happening is that this if the total number say for example, if a cluster has say 5 chlorophyll B molecule and 5 chlorophyll A molecule, they will be absorbing a certain amount of light within a certain way, but if I keep on changing the numbers if chlorophyll A is number is higher than chlorophyll B or something. So, your total absorption is going to change. So, that is what gives it an edge by having not having a single chlorophyll molecule, but instead having two chlorophyll molecules which ensures that you can you know tweak or play around with the absorption of the molecule at a specific A. Okay. So, this is about the structure of the chlorophyll molecule. Now, next pertinent question what we are going to answer or go going to kind of you know try to understand is something called a reaction center. So, if I take you back to the some of the previous slides ok. So, again coming back to this light where the light is falling and you could see that sun light is falling and then thylakoid membrane there are chlorophyll molecules which are getting oxidized ok and then again coming back to the ground state ok. Let me come back here ok. So, now does so, now let us imagine a situation ok. So, 
suppose this is a part of the leaf and there are a lot of chlorophyll molecules. So these are all the C's stand for the chlorophyll molecules. Okay. When the light falls here or does all of them simultaneously start ejecting electron and gets activated. It has been observed that the story is really not like that. What happens is that so within a pool of chlorophyll molecules, there are some very specific centers called the reaction centers. So, say for example, this one. Say for example, this is the reaction center, which I am circling with, uh, with the red. So, what happens when the light falls? So, there is a transfer of electron like this taking place, vibrational energy transfer. They are getting excited and eventually they reach to that unique center, which is called a reaction center. Where this whole process of electron emission starts. Other than that, this whole energy is being transferred. What we do not know is that who determines the reaction center and does the reaction center changes as the plant is living its life. We do not know this, but this is one of the very unsolved uh, uh, mysteries because. Uh, I will come to that, how, how it has been discovered, because in the next class, that is what we are going to do, how this reaction center itself was discovered. But it is not all the chlorophyll molecules are taking part in you know, this whole cascade. One of the um, thing which you could speculate is that probably because of this reaction center concept, the longevity of the leaf is increasing, because it is not all the molecules are at excited state just because of the light. Okay. So, with this concept, I will close in on this class and in the next class, what we will do is, uh, let us go back where we were. Okay. So, we have do done with the discovery of the basic reactions, we are done with the structure of the chlorophyll to trap solar energy and now we have just initiated with the reaction center. And from the reaction center, we will talk about the different experiments which have been performed and from there, we will move on to the next part of it and how these will be translated in terms of energy production. Thanks a lot.